Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to our virtual chat events. What about creation care? Christian stewardship and climate action. Our panelists today are Lindsay Linsky, Milo Wilson, and Bob Inglis. This event is hosted by Republican and the Evangelical Environmental Network. My name is Wen Lee. I am Republican's engagement director, and thank you all so much for joining us today. Here's an outline for today's event. We'll start off with a brief orientation and organizational introductions. After that, our panelists will have a conversation about creation care, and then we'll have plenty of time for you all to ask questions to our panel. Right, so I'm sure that you are all um, very familiar with Zoom, thanks to the pandemic. Uh, but just to remind everyone, there is a chat feature, um, which we encourage you all to use. So I'm um, going to uh, write into the uh, chat right now and just say hi to everyone. Make sure that you say send to everyone and you say hi. Um, so you should see a flashing light on your screen. If you click on that, it will open up the chat box. And this is where you can write comments and uh, submit questions for our panels uh, throughout the event today. Um, so some people are already saying hi, and that's great. So um, let's just make sure it's working for everyone. So now I invite everyone to just type in the chat right now. Please say hi, um, tell us your name and what city and state you are joining us from. So uh, please type in your name and city and state. Just wanna make sure that this chat is working for everyone and also see where, where folks are joining us from. All right, Albany. And we've got Massachusetts, Texas, Long Beach, Idaho. This is great. Tennessee, Pittsburgh, Washington. Fantastic, this is wonderful. Great, fantastic. Okay, well, um, we're going to get started, but first you might be wondering who is Republican and who is EEN. So I'll talk very quickly about Republican and then Mitch Hescox will tell you about EEN. All right, so are you conservative and concerned about climate change? Well, it turns out you are not alone. Republican is the place for you. We are conservatives talking to conservatives about climate change and how we can solve it. We call our movement the Eco Right. We uh, are a community of thousands of people across the country. Most of us are conservative, but we also have libertarians and independents. Uh, what we all have in common is that we take the threat of climate change seriously and we want to address it using effective small government solutions. And we also cheer on climate leadership uh, among conservatives in our country. So we hope after this event, you'll check out Republican and get more involved with our community. All right, so now uh, Mitch Hescox is the uh, EEN's president and CEO. He's gonna say a few words, and after that, I'll introduce our guests. Thank you, and very much. And um, EEN is the Evangelical Environmental Network, represents over 5 million pro-life Christians who have taken action on air pollution, climate change, or protecting our public lands in the past three or four years. We are a nonpartisan, nonprofit group but we're a people of faith. We were founded back in 1993, and we are certainly the leading evangelical voice in the care of creation care, advocacy, and education. But before I go to the next slide, I gotta tell you a brief story about uh, Bob Inglis. Uh, I met Bob when he was still walking the halls of Congress. Actually, when I left being a local church pastor, um, the first person I ever called on was Bob Inglis, and we actually met outside the house chamber um, with one of his staff members. And I will never forget the first thing that we did was we made a circle and we prayed together. I have great respect for Bob Inglis, uh, a champion, a brother in Christ, and I am so glad that the EEN is co-hosting this with us. And if you just flip to the next slide, I'll wrap up here pretty quickly. Um, you know, we're Christians, we're evangelical Christians, and our vision statement is real simple. We want to share the fullness of the gospel of Christ. We, were, we envision a world with an abundant life for all people where they're free from pollution, where all creation flourishes, and especially one of our prime things with creation care being a matter of life, 
is that children have hope and an expectation for a healthy, vibrant future. And so our mission is we try to educate evangelical Christians and be a prophetic voice in the halls of Congress on what the Bible really says about caring for creation. So we're all about a stable climate in a healthy, pollution-free world. And we're so glad to be co-sponsoring this event with Bob and the whole team there at Republican. Thank you much. God bless. Okay, thank you so much, Mitch. All right, oops. So we are very excited for our guests today. And um, we have, uh, in addition to Bob, we have um, two wonderful guests, Lindsay Linsky and Milo Wilson. Um, so Dr. Lindsay Linsky is the author of Keep It Good, Understanding Creation Care Through Parables, a book that breaks through environmental apathy and partisan noise to show Christians God's simple yet beautiful message of creation stewardship. She has been featured on podcasts such as Creation Care Radio and Yale Climate Connections. Lindsay earned her PhD in science education from the University of Georgia and lives with her family in Suwannee. <laughs> Milo Wilson is the lead pastor at Randall Baptist Church in Buffalo, New York. He served in the Marines as a musician before obtaining both music and Christian ministry degrees from North Greenville University in South Carolina. Milo returned home to Western New York with a desire to see lives changed and new churches planted by the power of Jesus. As a catalytic leader and lover of the outdoors, Milo believes God gave us a garden to tend and we should be champions in stewarding his creation. Thank you both Milo and Lindsay for being here today. So without further ado, um, I'll now hand it over to former Congressman and Republicans Executive Director Bob Inglis, who is going to lead our conversation today. Thank you, Wynn. And uh, that's Wynn Lee, our engagement director. So uh, you get all these emails from her. Now you get to see her. There she is. <clears throat> so thank you, Wynn. And um, thank you very much, Mitch, for uh, joining us here and for being part of this. You know, um, yes, I, I well remember Mitch uh, as one of the people on the first, uh, first into this space of trying to convince conservatives that it's actually pretty conservative to act on climate change, particularly if you operate from a faith frame. So uh, that's Mitch, that's EEN, that's Young Evangelicals for Climate Action, wonderful folks who are, are great partners here. And Wynn has already introduced our panelists, but I'm gonna start with a little bit extra introduction for Lindsay and Milo. <laughs> so Lindsay, I will tell you, um, we first met at a very underperforming event in Alabama. In fact, I think Lindsay and I and about three other panelists were speaking to two people, I think in the audience, and maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit, Lindsay, it wasn't quite that big of a bust, but it was pretty close to a bust. But the great thing about it was, Lindsay handed me this book, Keeping It Good. Can you see my, Keeping It Good. And so I, uh, I get a lot of books. Um, Mitch, I'm sure you travel a lot and you probably, well, before coronavirus. And so you probably had the same experience. People hand you a book and you sort of politely take it and think, uh, probably headed to the recycling bin. Okay, that's a true confession. Really, a lot of them do end up in the recycling bin. Um, but this one, I just opened it and started reading it, Lindsay, on the plane, as you know. And I fell in love with the book, um, read the whole thing. Uh, got extra copies to give to all of my five children um, because it's really a neat thing. And so let's start, uh, then, then I'm going to tell you a minute about Milo, but, but uh, Lindsay, tell us essentially what the book is about parables and uh, the power of parables. Yes, yeah. I, I borrow from Jesus's teaching style a little bit to basically try to put people into kind of a the mental flight simulator and help them see things from a little bit of a different point of view because parables have a way of letting you step into somebody else's shoes and and see the world from a, an angle perhaps you hadn't considered and um, they're also like Jesus's where I tried to make them as everyday life and easy to relate to as possible so that I'm, I'm so glad that you enjoyed it oh and Lindsay, tell them about the first, and I'm really I'm going to introduce Milo here in a second, but add him to this conversation, but just to give him a feel for that, 
tell them how it starts with the it just it, it's an awesome description of the parents and the house and the kids and the party yes well um <laughs> to give you a little context i i was driving home one day from grad school and um it had always you know, I grew up in the Bible Belt, and and I never really understood why the creation care message wasn't a bigger central part of the Christian mission here in the South. And um, then, I, you know, I was in grad school for a science education. I was a science teacher for a number of years, and driving home one night, and it, this epiphany just, you know, kind of hit me out of the blue of a house and this um, family that lives in the house and the parents that have worked so hard to to make this house what it is and all of the i mean all the furniture and fixing the pipes and mowing the lawn and you know all the things you do for to make a home a home for your family and um then i thought about well how would the parents want the children to treat that house and and you know what would what would they say if they you know were tearing it apart and making a big mess or or even causing one child to to use all the resources and hurting the other and so forth so um so yeah the first one is just a parent looking at his house and thinking about gosh you know so much has come to this come into this and he's looking on his creation if you will and thinking it is good and in the second one the children tear the house apart so <laughs> yes in, yeah. in a wild party on the weekend and yeah, uh teenagers and yeah. uh the parents go away leave them in charge it's really so appropriate and so fits uh the situation of god the creator and mm -hmm. us in his creation so we'll come back to that now let me tell you about milo uh when introduced milo already but i gotta add a little bit of that you see i met milo on the last day of one of my re-election campaigns, thankfully one of the successful re-election campaigns, not that last one that was unsuccessful. But uh, so I approached this house, it was getting dark, you know, and right at the end of October, 1st of November, it gets dark fairly early, right? And so um, I know this is gonna be the last house that I can knock on the door. And so um, uh, I approach the house and I see uh, uh, Aaron, uh, Milo's wife, practicing violin in the bay window. And so I go up to the door, knock on the door. Milo answers the door. He's got one child on his hip and one is at his feet. And um, so uh, we start the conversation and Milo says to me, yeah, we're Christians here. Well, he didn't need to tell me that because when he had opened the door, the love had just enveloped the space between me and the street. I mean, it was like just this love came out of the house. And so um, I thought about a lot of my head was, yeah, I already knew that. Um, and then uh, so Milo says, uh, so we're concerned about moral issues. And I, I, so I took my brochure. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. See right here. It says, uh, says I'm pro-life. It's right there. See right there. And so Milo says, yeah, we're concerned about other moral issues like poverty. And so then he kept talking, but I interrupted him and I said, climate change. He said, oh, it's very real. We should do something about it. And so I go like this. I say, Jesus freaks. Great to meet you. <laughs> and so, so, uh, that started a, uh, Relationships, I won't go on the rest of it because it, uh, Milo and I would probably end up weeping on this call about them losing a child and uh, then uh, almost going to happen anyway. Uh, Milo helping me through other things. Um, and so, uh, Milo, now with that introduction, <laughs> tell us, <laughs> pick up there and tell us, uh, tell us what you would add about to what Lindsay was just saying about how we approach this issue of creation care. And uh, where do you start with the analysis? Well, thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's definitely, you, you, that's quite a handoff you gave me there. Um, yeah. <laughs> but the reality is, yeah, from, from an early age, I think uh, God kind of just placed it on my heart uh, and has definitely uh, been part of who we've been as a couple and our family is to say, uh, just like that, that, that house analogy, you know, we read in scripture about of the Holy Spirit in our, our hearts and our lives. And so in a similar way, uh, we want to be able to uh, communicate uh, well uh, the, the stewardship 
uh, for everyone. We're not sure what you're going to hear. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, we're, um, it's a little bit broken up, but uh, we're hearing you okay. Is your, is your microphone covered at all, Milo? It may be. Let me try. Uh, just a second here. If not, just try speaking louder. Oh, is, that, is that any better? Mm, not really. Now there's a wire in the way. <laughs> <laughs> Making it worse. All right, try that again. Any better now? Mm, not particularly, but I think if you if you try to project, we'll we'll be able to hear you. Okay. All right. If we're still having trouble, I can switch devices and, and be back with you in just a minute. So, um, so so the basis of it would say, um, as as time has passed, uh, I've, I've gotten more opportunities to lead, uh, more opportunities uh, to be someone who has a voice in the conversation. Uh, I think I've always been excited about someone like. Uh, like Bob and the way that he has led, and um, but but now I have an opportunity as the pastor and the leader of the church to make some of those kind of changes uh, for myself. So uh, I'm going to switch devices, guys, and then uh, we'll, we'll pick up where we left off. Sound good? Yeah. And why why are you switching that device? Let me, uh, Mitch, you still there? Um, I hope. I'm here. Uh, oh, good, Mitch. <clears throat> um, you're younger than me, but you're older than. Lindsay, and you're older than Milo. And I wonder if it's people my age and north of me who um, have this contest between faith and science that I don't know that either Milo or Lindsay see. But, but do, do you think that's true? You think it's, it's evangelicals had a contest back, you know, the Scopes Monkey Trial and all that. I mean, you think that's what some of what we deal with? I think that's a fair amount of what we deal with. I think the more important issue is until people like you and I started talking about climate change and others, we didn't talk about it with the same values that most evangelicals have. Um, and you, you mentioned pro-life. I am pro-life, but um, to me, I take the same definition of the National Association of Evangelicals and the Catholic Church that pro-life is all about life from conception till natural death. It's a holistic view. You know, right now in the United States, 200,000 people die every year from soot, PM 2.5. And the biggest cause of soot is fossil fuels, the same thing that's driving climate change. You know, and so when I talk to people in churches all over the country, um, when I mention those things about children's health, it's a way to engage in a different way, not just about science, but using something that's very dear to people, their kids. You know, one in four children in the United States have asthma, autism, ADHD, or severe allergies, all related to petrochemicals and fossil fuels, one of the leading causes of that. So, you know, helping people to understand that caring about God's creation is about caring about children's health. It's caring about your health. And I yeah. think framing it in that dialogue is a great way to do it. Yeah, interesting. And, 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 and Lindsay, do you speak for young believers. You're a young believer. You know, you're young. Um, tell me, is that true that, am I, am I right, that you find generally that young believers really do care about creation and, and really are a little bit different than their grandparents? Is, am I right about that or is that uh, or am I off? Uh, there's a mix in my experience, and I don't have any data to point to, but, um, you know, I, in my experience there, there are more young believers that are open to, open to um, climate change in terms of, you know, and adopting it as, as, and environmental action and so forth. But there are also, I know plenty of people that are, um, that subscribe to every single aspect of the you know, Republican agenda and like to the letter, especially now after pandemic seems to have amped all of that up. But uh, so, so I see both and it's not, um, yes, there are more young people that um, would be open to this message, but there, but there are still some that are holding out. Yeah. And Milo, do you, what, what do you see? Um, and you're, you're pastoring a church there near Buffalo. Uh, now you got a new, uh, a different device. Let's see how you're doing now. Oops, uh, you're muted. Um, or ch um, when can you unmute Milo? There we go. There we go. Okay. Better? We can hear that better? 
Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We can hear yes. you now. Yeah, good. Uh, yeah, pastoring a church now. Uh, I'm in Buffalo, New York. And so uh, we are in an area, I would say, compared to when I was there uh, with you uh, in South Carolina, an area that is probably much more aware of the needs and, and, and creation care uh, and, and locally in that side of things. Um, but it is still the same uh, battle uh, within the church as to whether or not uh, creation was created for us to uh, pillage to our needs, uh, or if, if it's something that we really have the same mandate we do elsewhere in scripture for the stewardship of the resources that we've been given, that it's already God's, it's all his, and it's our responsibility uh, to carry that uh, and, and carry it with, with the ultimate care. And so uh, that is a, a battle that I think, uh, regardless of where we are, what part of the country we're in, we're going to continue to to work through that because it's just much easier uh, to to do what suits us uh, well. And it's much easier to let someone else deal with the problems. And so it goes uh, with our sin nature of, of just what is uh, much easier for us to chase after. And so I do believe it's a holistic approach. Uh, if we're going to be people who are God-fearing people, then we need to be people who take care of what we've been given in so many ways. So I preach a sermon on Sunday and ask people to give to the church. I ask them to do that because it's part of a holistic idea of what we're doing as a church matters. And so I believe that God has given us a creation. And so this garden to tend is, as I like to talk about it, like we, we have a responsibility there to do all that we can to steward it well. And you know about tending the garden, uh, Milo, because uh, you grew up on a farm, right? I did. I, my other camera angle is better. I have little toy tractors here in the background <laughs> to demonstrate my, my farming background. But yeah, I grew up on a dairy farm with a couple hundred cows, about five or 600 acres and and uh, I never had a curfew growing up. I just had to work at four o'clock in the morning. And so uh, <laughs> I could go out as late as I wanted. I just had to be ready to work. And dad would never let me call in sick. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so that's awesome. Lindsay, there's a, uh, a word in Genesis chapter one about uh, dominion. Mm -hmm. And uh, Milo was uh, sort of touching on it there. That's, the, that's, that's where a lot of this debate turns on, right? Is, uh, is what is the nature of that dominion? What, what do you, what do you, how do you read that? Or what, uh, that, that word in uh, the first chapter of Genesis? Right. Ah. Yes. Yeah. Domin the, the dominion is one of them. God gave Adam and Eve dominion. And so some take that to mean we can do whatever we want. And then there's first Timothy three something that says like God gave us all things for our enjoyment. And so some take that to mean, well, then that means we can just take as much as we want, but you know, I, I like to ask a question when that comes up, you know, we're, here's a teaching strategy. We tell our, our, our developing teachers this, that, we're, you know, self-discovery is often one of the best ways to help people learn something new. And um, I like to ask, okay, you know, I hear what you're saying, but where in scripture does God tell us it's okay to indulge, you know, to just take, take, take as much as we want, you know, because I thought that you know, one of the fruits of the spirit was self-control. And um, so it isn't anything that goes against God's characters, you know, aren't we supposed to kind of set that aside and not pay attention to that? So, yeah, I think um, it, it, it is a challenge. It is a challenge. And I think it helps to, you know, also point to other things that we've been told, like, like the um, looking at God's character and self-control, but um, also like Milo was saying, kind of just getting back to basics, you know, we have things that we disagree on in, in among the different denominations, but, you know, we all agree that, you know, we're supposed to love our neighbor and serve the least and walk humbly and seek justice. And we're supposed to run everything we do through that lens and it stops with environmental decisions. That can't be possible because the, what we do, what our environmental actions have tremendous effects on our neighbor and you know so that's i think that's also at the heart of it yeah and and uh, very very helpful and, and mitch you had you had the hebrew word there yeah uh, the, the hebrew word is rada and it's only used 21 times i believe in the entire old testament mm -hmm. and the word taken to mean dominion a better way to describe it is to be a shepherd it was a word used for israel's kings of how they cared for their people mm -hmm. and most times it's used in the negative sense where the bad kings of Israel have poor radah, poor dominion over their people because they aren't stewarding their people. 
And it's really a mistranslation that comes out of the feudal society of when the Bible was written down in English for the first time of looking at that, you know, the King James version and looking at that hierarchical mode instead of the relational mode that God has called us to. And I think, you know, very clearly, even in Psalm 22, it says God still has dominion over everything. We're just after that. And you can't take away that, you know, Leviticus 25, where it says we're but tenants of the lands. We're never to be owners and the land can't be sold. You know, so the Bible is filled with these ways of sharing and caring and being the kingdom of God. And I think very very interesting. And so would Milo, if I were teaching a Bible study at your church and I said this, would I be all right with you if I said, you know, okay, so let's say it is dominion. Um, If it's dominion, what does Christ's dominion look like? Well, let's see. He's washing the disciples' feet, taking the place of the lowest servant in the house. That's what dominion of the Son of God looks like. Right. So, um, if it's dominion, okay. In other words, you can you can take it the way that um, Mitch was just doing, which is a good uh, a good scriptural argument. But you can also say, okay, even even if it were dominion, as in a feudal society, what does that Lord look like? in this right. this crazy upside down world of the gospel where jesus is the servant right i mean that's the so it's radical uh, he's a rather radical fellow this jesus yeah for sure and, and i think again you if you are going to look at scripture as a whole you're going to have to do stuff like look at the transition between uh the book of luke and the book of acts and jesus sends into heaven he says you will be my witnesses uh, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the world. And then he spends all of the book of Acts demonstrating how uh, the authority has been uh, rippled out. He's, he's breaking down all these barriers, breaking down all these walls, every nation, every people. And you can't look at that and, and see how God is making himself available and accessible to everyone uh, and still insist that it's okay uh, for for one group of people or one dominant group of people uh, to take everybody else on and allow them to take the suffering uh, for that because it doesn't match up with the, the rest of the theology of what's being taught there in the book of Acts. And you see again and again and again uh, the responsibility that the apostles take uh, in teaching a, a gospel that was available to all. And so when it comes to the care of our creation, uh, we, I believe it's a similar process is you can't assume, uh, you cannot uh, you know, build an argument for why we don't care about those other people or wouldn't be uh, important for us to keep them in mind and keep the creation that God has given us in mind uh, across the board. Yeah, so um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open it up here to questions uh, um, here in a second. Uh, Price Atkinson, who you see his name up there, he's going to be screening the questions or, or, or handing them over to Wynn, and then Wynn's going to read them to us. So there's Price, he's waving to you. Um, so uh, Milo, picking up on that or pitching it to either Lindsay or Mitch, whoever wants to comment on this, I was once shocked um, to hear a grandpa say to me, I said, I, I challenged him, I said, what about your grandkids? And he said, uh, as to the earth and, you know, uh, care for the earth, he said, oh, they'll figure out something. They'll invent something. And I, I was just taken aback. I was like, what? <laughs> what? You, you, you're not going to exercise your responsibility. You're not going to take uh, care for them. You're going to just leave it to them to figure out how to live on the earth after we've created climate change. What, what do you think's going on there? What would you, what would you have said to that grandpa? Anybody got something nice to say to the grandpa? I mean, or, well, how would you have handled that? From we got two pastors on the line here. That's uh, that's Mitch and uh, Milo, and we got uh, Lindsay, who's a writer and an educator. Tell me how to deal with that that grandpa. I would have just said, "Don't you love your kids?" Mm-hmm. Do you love your grandchildren? Don't you want them to have a bright future? And I think that's a respond with a question is something Jesus did an awful lot. And uh, when he says, absolutely, then I think we better care about, you know, your children, their future, what the world's going to look like. And actually, you know, I think one of the things we often forget about when we talk about caring for creation is there's certainly an awful lot of hope. 
if humanity caused this, humanity can help to solve this with God's help. And looking to future and clean jobs, I mean, right, I have seven grandchildren. I definitely, I'm one of those people. I, I want to see my kids driving up to my house when I retire in an all electric car, you know, having a great job in the clean energy business or whatever else they do, being pastors, children. And that vision and hope is available to all people. And what's even better is we can help end poverty around the world. We can end death from pollution. There's great dreams of hope if we just start turning around and thinking what we can do with Jesus' help. And I think that's one of the key messages we have to talk about today. And, and Lindsay, what, what would you say to that, uh, that, that grandpa you, as an educator? How would, you, how would you turn him around? Well, um, the biggest challenge, I think, in, uh, thinking as a teacher, the biggest challenge in communicating climate change is that it's so abstract and so distant. And for some, it feels far away. And so I think it's really helpful to provide uh, stories and examples of people that are suffering here and now. Like I would... If that person was in front of me, I would probably say, well, you know, I had the ble extreme blessing of being able to go to uh, COP25 in Madrid. And, and, you know, when I, when I hear you saying that about, oh, they'll figure something out, I can't help but think about the, um, the, people, the stories that haunt me even now, like the, the delegates from these tiny island nations that are weeping in front of all these international dignitaries up on stage and just so, you know, desperate for their people. And I can't help but think about the stories of these farmers that are planting their crops in buckets and because they have to move it at high tide in order to be able to keep it to survive. And, you know, the goodness, there was one delegate in the, in, from the Bahamas who said that, um, I, I can't remember what the name of the hurricane, but there were still a thousand people that were unaccounted for and had, had been believed to be washed out to sea, which is just like, ugh. so, I mean, I think about the people that are suffering now and say, you know, I, surely you wouldn't want that for your grandchildren, right? <laughs> yeah. So my, Milo, jump in and tell me what, tell me what you, you got anything pastoral to say to that guy? Well, yeah, I guess pastoral wise, I, I was able to snatch my Bible while the others were answering and just um, in Isaiah chapter 39, we find out about a man named Hezekiah, who uh, basically gets the word that his kingdom's going to come apart. Um, and Isaiah says to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord Almighty, the time surely will come and everything in your palace, all that your fathers have stored up until this day will be carried off to Babylon, nothing will be left. And none of your descendants, your own flesh and your blood will be born to you, but they'll all be taken away. They'll become eunuchs. They'll be in the past of Babylon. And his response is one of the saddest responses possible. He says, the word you have spoken is good because there will be peace and security in my lifetime. Uh, there's nothing I have to worry about. So before I die, I'll be wow. fine. But it's my kids, my grandkids. They're the ones that are going to have to suffer. And the author, Isaiah, he, he picks up the next verse after this awful thing that the Israelites are hearing, that, that their grandfather, their king, had just stuck them with uh, the Assyrians were going to come in, and they were coming. And he says, comfort, comfort my people, speak tenderly, proclaim to her, and goes on to talk about how uh, there will be a voice of the one calling, prepare the way of the Lord. Every mountain will be rise up, every valley will be made low all talking about the Messiah who was to come, the great shepherd, and this, this comforting voice that's there. So the reality is, is that story of the grandfather who says, you know, it's my kid's problem to deal with it. We all know that that story is being told again and again, over and over. They're not always saying it that directly, but it's being shared again and again. And so maybe today, yeah, maybe we need to hear a little bit of voice of comfort uh, that you're going to be going through some trials uh, but there is one to come who can make all things new, who can correct uh, the wrong that's there. But there's stories again and again in scripture about the father, the grandfather, who just says, I don't care as long as I'm okay. And uh, the only comfort we find in that is through, through our father. Wow, that's, that's, that's really something that Isaiah passage is powerful. And Wynn's probably got a question before, I, before you go to that question, Lynn, when I got to tell you this is we had Jeff Bridges on a webinar, you know, the dude, and uh, Jeff has this film, and what he, he has this long pregnant pause after he, in that amazing voice, says, we care about our grandchildren, right? Mm -hmm. And then the filmmaker makes it so there's a long pause. It's really an interesting, it's, it's probably one of the most interesting points in the film, I think, because uh, it's, 
it really calls into question, Milo, that whether you do care about them, right? Um, and so, um, when what, what, what questions do you have for us? Okay, yeah, they're starting to come in, and so um, we'll, we'll go through as many as we can. So let's see. We have a question. Uh, let's see. We'll choose Brian's first. Um, Brian says, Lindsay alluded to this briefly, but often we focus on our duty as Christians to care for creation. But should we be more focused on our duty to care for other people and that our impacts on the environment has direct harm to others? Dominion, Dominion makes sense when there are fewer people on the planet, but now everything we do to the planet impacts somebody else. Yeah. Lindsay, you want to you pick up on that? Because that is sort of a following up on your, your observation there. Yes. Yeah. Um, gosh, every decision we make, I mean, it does have, because, you know, that, that's one thing from the chapters that I think it's, it's, it's chapter five. There's a, we have a new definition of neighbor, you know, Jesus, there was the, what that was it like an attorney that asked who now is my neighbor or who, and who is my neighbor. And, um, you know, in Jesus's lifetime, there were, I think they only traveled what, like, 30 miles away from his hometown or, you know, hardly less than a hundred miles. And so the definition of neighbor was very, very clear. But when you're buying groceries from the other side of the world and when you are, you know, doing things like, like dri even driving your car that causes all of the, you know, it, it, sure you live in the suburbs, but what about the people in the city and you drive there every day? And so the things we do do have do impact our neighbors, even if they're not immediately next to us, and uh, and can for a, for a long time. And so it's it's definitely something that we need to think about as Christians if we're serious about caring for our neighbors. Okay. Very yeah. helpful. Okay, let's see, uh, Jonah. Jonah um, writes, would it be better to focus on the issues of environmentalism around the harms of pollution uh, more directly on health so that those who don't believe in climate change don't use that to insist on inaction, meaning to stop talking so much about climate change and focus on the diseases caused by pollution in the water and air? Mitch, you were, you, that's, a, that's a theme that EEN has used uh, quite a bit to, to success in reaching uh, fellow believers, right? Yeah, absolutely. And it's not that we deny climate change, but we use the children's health impact of pollution as a way to help people understand the climate change. And if I could tell just a quick story from down in Mobile, Alabama a year ago, um, we were doing an event down there and we had dinner with one of the people that was coming the day before who was an adamant climate denier. I mean, absolutely, you know, it was the work of the devil, this whole disinformation stuff. And so the next day he showed up at our, the seminar that we did and I talked about the children's health issue. And he came up to me afterwards, so you're telling me climate change is causing all these health issues? No, I said the same thing that's causing these health issues is also climbing, causing climate change. Okay, I can act on that now because it's hurting my grandkids. And I believe that's a true statement for many people. It's, you know, I believe that you have to get to people's hearts. And then in our evangelical world, then you teach them through the Bible. And so the easiest way that I found to get to people is to talk to them about the health of their children or their grandchildren, because it is severe. I mean, 200,000 people, you know, we just crossed 200,000 COVID de deaths today or yesterday. On average, we kill, as I mentioned earlier, 200,000 people a year just from soot in the United States. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. And just, if I could piggyback on that, you know, I think in, it's also important to um, consider your audience. And if you know the, the individual, you know, if you, if you have firsthand knowledge of the, of the person you're trying to, you know, talk to, you know, a lot of times it's, it's finding the right time and moment. You know, I have a similar um, friend that, you know, as to what Mitch was describing. And, you know, uh, we, I recently saw this person and, um, you know, also a climate denier, I recently saw this person and, you know, as circumstances would have it, I'm, I'm, it's certainly not, not a good thing, but, but there, there come, turns out there is a um, manufacturing plant near her house that is putting off these awful toxic fumes and she knows what I do and she trusts me and she, um, and so she comes to me and she goes, Lindsay, you've got to help me with this. You got to look into this, you know, and, and so that um, paved the way for conversations about, well, there've been a lot of rollbacks. And so, um, you know, that, 
Yeah, no, because it all comes down to the policy. And so a lot of it is timing. And um, especially if you're, if you're working with um, conservative Christians, in my experience, they are watching our fruit very carefully. Um, they, they want to know that we are true Christ followers before they will listen to us. And um, so I think it's important for those of you out there, you know, if you're trying to reach conservative Christians um, and, uh, and you yourself are a Christian, is to not conform to the patterns of the activists around you, you know, and because and the finger pointing judgment could actually make people regress. You know, there's been a lot of, a lot of uh, research into um, how people learn, you know, I'm a PhDs in science ed and I work with future teachers and um, the, people go, it takes students four steps to go from believing the wrong thing or, or understanding the wrong thing, thinking they, to adopting the correct information. And it's, it would be damaging to assume that, that, that people are 100% on the far end of the climate denial uh, spectrum when they, given all of the different current events with the uh, fires and everything else, they might be edging more toward the middle. And so coming at them with finger pointing judgment and anger could actually make them regress and be more adamant in their denials. Um, so, so that's, that's something else that you need to kind of keep in mind. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it, uh, Milo, you know, what, what I felt coming out of the door at, on that cul-de-sac when I knocked on your door as the sun was setting, that's what, that that's what Lindsay was just talking about, right? If that comes out of our mouths and of our affect in this conversation about climate, we'll win people over, right? If uh, if it comes out that we really don't like you or something, and that's you know we think you're the dumb kid in the class, probably not going to work too well. Is that, am I right? Milo is it? Uh, is Milo still there? Hello, Milo. Uh, so, uh, Milo, you Sorry, might be. There, there, yep. there, 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 there I got you there. Yep. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. Like, uh, the chief end of man we, we study is to glorify God, uh, it, it is to exemplify Him in all that we do. And so, uh, it isn't very uh, appealing, uh, you know, to, to come after somebody immediately uh, in that response. And, and so, if, if we're really going to approach things in that manner, then uh, there should be something lovely uh, about it. And, and I know you've, I've heard you share that demonstration before, the idea of opening the door and the sun was coming through. I, I just think the sun was shining behind us. I have no idea uh, <laughs> no, what, no, was, no, what was going no, on there. No, but, no, 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 no. It's, it's, it's love was, coming out of the door. Yeah. And I genuinely think that when we love people well, uh, we open the door. Uh, a friend of mine likes to say that uh, good works are the bridge by which the good news can travel. And so you, you have to kind of build that rapport. You have to make a connection there that, that we're not trying to uh, battle uh, with somebody all the time, uh, that sometimes, you know, they just need to feel comfort. Certainly in days like we're in right now, uh, people need to know that someone is in control other than the people that they assume are pulling the puppet strings right now, uh, that God is in control. And so uh, if we can just have that type of attitude uh, a lot of times uh, it, it can build conversation. Yeah. When you get another question there? Yes, I do. Um, CJ um, is thinking about the um, parallels between climate change and COVID, um, how some people feel that for COVID, no masks are needed in the beginning um, and they're not um, taking it very, they didn't take it very seriously in the beginning. Um, and so, uh, well, she's wondering, you know, how you all see any parallels between these issues and um, how we can get people to, to think uh, in terms of, of evolving and, and, and um, taking things um, seriously and being proactive. That sounds like a question for Lindsay. Lindsay was just saying to us that there are four steps you go from, say, saying that, uh, you know, don't get your kids vaccinated, maybe to, yeah, it makes sense to get vaccinated your kids. So th there are four steps you say there, Lindsay, huh? Um, th that's the process. Yes, yeah, it is a process. And, um, and I do see parallels between COVID and, 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 uh, and this conversation. And it comes down to, you know, do nothing out of selfish ambition or, or vain conceit. But, but yeah, those four steps, um, you know, it starts with dissatisfaction 
you know, basically just saying, okay, you know what, I'm not totally satisfied with this, with this particular thing I thought I knew. And then it gradually grows to intelligibility where you can kind of say, okay, yes, I understand the basic principles and maybe I can even repeat that back, but I uh, haven't totally adopted it. You know, you can explain climate change, but you can't really, you know, it's not really something that you have subscribed to and you're not gonna change anything about your life yet. And then the third is plausibility where you might, where you start saying, okay, yeah, that's starting to make more sense than what I used to think. And then lastly, and most importantly is fruitfulness where the, where um, you look at this and you're saying, okay, yes, I can see that this is correct and I can see how I can apply that elsewhere. So that's the fruitful aspect. And it is a process and it's not something that, you know, I feel like all of us as environmentalists, we're looking for this like silver bullet argument where if I can get it just right, then I will be able to convince them. But you know, it's a, the fact of the matter is it's a process. And if we, if, you know, we just have to keep at it in love and respect and um, wait for those moments like I had with my friend where she was like, you've got to help me with this, you know, where you're able, where God opens that door and you're able to have that conversation. Yeah, and, and let me apply that to, to mask wearing, okay? So the science would tell us, as I understand it, that it really is a good idea to wear a mask um, and that we really could love our neighbors by wearing a mask, um, as in keeping my droplets to myself rather than sharing them with you. Um, and I can, if they're wearing them, they can protect me, you know? And so really it is about loving your neighbor. So I saw in the paper this morning, a picture of a football game and all the various styles of mask wearing are in effect there. You know, you have the very popular neck gaiter. Have you noticed that style where the mask covers the Adam's apple? Um, then there's the popular over the ear, just the off one ear. That's a very nice style statement. And then the ever popular, the most popular is one under the nose. So that, uh, of course, no droplets go out of the nose. They just go out of the mouth. So anyway, my, my, my wonder is what's behind, there's something else going on there. And this is a question for any one of the three of you. And it really does go sort of maybe even to a pastoral level here. It's like, what would cause me to say that I just won't do it? I, I won't do it. Um, what, why is that? What, what's, what's going on there? Anybody got any, any, any uh, or, or is it just a lack of information or is it just, uh, no, I, I refuse because, um, because it says something about me. I, I refuse to, to do it. What, what do you think, uh, Mitch or Milo? Or? For me, I think a lot of it is we have taken the, the attitude of self-determination and the individual person to an extreme now in this country. A good friend of mine said a couple years ago when the we game first became popular, you know, we're the only country in the world that spells we with two eyes. And I think there's a lot of truth <laughs> to that. Um, and I think that wow. uh, we have, and you know, and if you look back at the Bible, that's the original thing that Adam and Eve, the sin of the garden was wanting to be like God. They wanted to be in control. They were tempted to want to be just like God. And I think that's our great problem in the world today is each individual wants to be like God and an island to themselves instead of living in community. And I think one of the things that the most helpful thing that I work on is in the United States is rebuilding a sense of community, rebuilding who our neighbors are, whether they're next door or right nor, you know, or far away. And so rebuilding that sense of community is the job of the church, I believe. And it's one thing that I think that we can help this whole society is just being Christians, living in community. That's what the Bible talks about. Yeah. My, yeah. Milo, Milo add, add to that. Yeah. Well, again, to, I think I'm on here to give a pastoral thought to some of these things. And so as, as that's kind of coming through my mind, I, I do think of uh, Matthew chapter three is John the Baptist, a story of John the Baptist and his, his whole life is summed up in one word and that is to repent. And the reality is, uh, which is no different from our day to day, uh, is that there was a lot of regrets. Uh, they regretted that they were no longer the kingdom that they once were. They regretted they were no longer uh, powerful and strong, and they no longer had their place before God that they once had before. Uh, but they were not willing. Uh, his argument uh, was it's time to repent, to walk 180 degrees in another direction. 
And uh, in a similar fashion, Jesus, one chapter later, begins his ministry with the exact same words, unless you repent, you all likewise perish. And so um, we as people have a lot of regrets. We regret that this planet isn't exactly what we would hope it to be. We regret that we haven't done a good enough job or that our forefathers haven't done a good enough job. But are we willing to repent? And I'll say as a, as a pastor who preaches that often from the pulpit, there are very few people in the congregation who are willing to actually repent and make that change. There's plenty of regrets, but the repentance is, is something that on these issues, are we willing to do that as a society? Wow, that, it's, it's really helpful. Yeah. Wayne, you got another question? Sure. Yeah, we are. Uh, we just we have a few minutes left. Um, Anne uh, is asking uh, for good Christian resources and books on climate. Um, we already named a couple, but um, yeah, any got, other? I've yeah, one. I've got one right here. Um, <laughs> here's one from Lindsay. <laughs> Lindsay, tell them about keeping it good. Yeah, and um, I, I'd same as after the podcast, I'd love to offer it as a free download for um, for anybody on the call that would be interested in in um, reading it. Uh, and um, and also, I, I saw one of the questions was about the those four stages. I can't take credit for that. The, um, if it's called the theory of conceptual change, and um, if you look it up on Google Scholar, Zirbel. Um, Z-I-R-B-E-L 2004 would be a good, um, if you want to know more about that. It is about science education, but that is essentially what we're doing, right? Is we are trying to educate people about the, about climate change. Um, and so that's, that's one I would like to add, but I know there's plenty of other resources. Yeah. And, and I'll shamelessly offer, since Lindsay's offering a free book, if people email Wynn or email me, I will be happy to mail them a copy of my book for free too. So you can do that. Oh, terrific. Thanks. Wonderful. Yeah, nice after, thanks you. Um, after after this event ends, I'll I'll email everyone a follow up email, and there you can um, let me know if you would like a copy of of either book, and then we'll we'll make it happen. Great. Last thoughts. Uh, tell tell us uh, since we're we're almost out of time here. Um, uh, are, are you uh, hopeful, Milo, that we're gonna we're gonna actually move from regrets to repentance and to action after that? Well, part of our story that you kind of alluded to is I was in the room a few times uh, when you were in some pretty tense uh, town halls and, and um, uh, your leadership in those examples was a, a voice of reason and uh, a calming in the storm. And I do believe that that's uh, the type of scenario that we uh, actually need to have as Christians uh, in this. Uh, if we are part of fueling the fire, uh, we'd, we'd be foolish to do that. Um, we, we do need to be able to uh, have a calm voice uh, in, in the middle of things. And I do think that there are a growing number of people who are willing to repent and to make adjustments and to make a 180 degree life change uh, to, to be able to do that, just like there are a few believers uh, who, who choose to change their life and pivot their life uh, for the sake of Christ. My argument would be is this is part of a holistic change uh, towards a gospel-centered life. And so, yeah, I am I'm optimistic that those who give their lives to Christ uh, would be willing to also give their lives uh, to caring for his creation. And, and Mitch, if you, if you are going to do what Milo was just describing, which is repent, you got to trust that there is a plenteous supply of grace, right? Absolutely. And I think one of the things that we fall short of, and one of the reasons we're so fearful as a nation is we don't believe in abundance of anything, abundance of money, abundance of food, abundance of things. And most of it's because we don't share. We're unwilling to trust God as the provider of everything. And I have a lot of hope and grace because, you know, Jesus said we could do greater things than he. There are tremendous folks of Christians who are out there working on this problem right now around the world. There's people in it, you know, when I go and talk to a local congregation, I get very little pushback when I talk to it the right way. And so it's having more forums like this where we can talk and educate people and tell them about God's love. And remember, I often end with the words of the second phrase in the Lord's Prayer, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lindsay, your last thoughts there. 
<clears throat> yeah, I have tremendous hope that we are on the verge of, of a big shift, at least in this country, in terms of uh, Christian stewardship for creation care. You know, I, I um, recently read a historical analysis of, of Christianity and looking at, I mean, all of Christianity from the start, you know, every 500 years we go through kind of like this turmoil where we say, okay, well, what's not working for us anymore? And what can we, you know, change to grow in the future? And um, it's so funny because every time there's, you know, there's political chaos and mass confusion and diverging cultures and it's like, check, 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 all of that's going on. And, uh, and I just, I really believe that creation care is going to be one of the things that we kind of figure out as a collective group in terms of, in terms of what needs to happen moving forward, because I mean, we're, those planet won't support us for another 500 years if we don't, but, um, you know, but also just, it's the right thing to do. And I think it is mm -hmm. the heart of God. Yeah. And if I could just close this, really appreciate, uh, uh, Lindsay and uh, Mitch and Milo for joining us and all of our uh, viewers here and participants in the questions. Um, you know, a couple of you have mentioned uh, speaking, speaking in love, basically, to um, especially believers, fellow believers, about creation care. And it seems to me what, what Mitch especially just said was, if you talk to them the right way. And it reminds me of a story of a young pastor who's having trouble with his church. Things are not going well. And so he asked a uh, more senior pastor to listen with him to a recording of a sermon. And that's what the elder pastor said is, well, bring me uh, a recording and let's sit together and I'll, well, I'll see what I can do to help you. And so they turn on the recording, they listen for just a few seconds. Senior pastor turns it off he says, I've got your problem. You don't love your people. And so um, he says, that's the problem you're having, is you actually have to love these people. And so um, I think that, <clears throat> you know, I, I, I've been at fault at that at times, you know, where I was like, why, why can't you get it? You know, <laughs> um, but we really need to have patience with people and say, you know, okay, so you've been fed a bill of goods by a lot of people who are just flat out lying to you. Um, and now let me approach credibly and, and mostly with love so that maybe you can hear it. And uh, you'll hear it a little bit differently. I think Milo was on that point. You know, you'll hear it differently if, you, if, if there's that love uh, that comes through it. Um, so anyway, I'll, um, it's a good place to, to end, I suppose, with the concept of love when we're talking about uh, Christian stewardship of, uh, of the planet and of our own lives and of our neighbors' lives. So uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us. Um, remember, the recording's going to be available. You can share it with other people. Wynn will be sharing an email follow-up, and you can yep. get a copy of, Lin of uh, Lindsay's book and of Mitch's book. And... Um, maybe even a recording of uh, Milo's sermons. Uh, and I'm certain that he loves his people at his church. So uh, <laughs> thanks, everybody. Anything Thank else, Wynn? Thank you so Wynn? much. No, that's great. Yeah, just be on the lookout uh, in your inbox for a follow-up email with all the resources we just mentioned. Thank you, Milo. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Mitch. Thank you, Bob. And thank you, everyone. See ya. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone.